Namaste. So far, we have seen how the monk approaches emptiness by a process of abstraction. First, he looked at the wilderness. And of course, the wilderness has a lot of detail in it. But then he abstracted the wilderness into the earth element, which of course comprises most of the details, the information in the perception of the wilderness. You have the earth, the rocks, the trees, and so many other things. So he took all those earthy things huh, and abstracted them into one perception, the perception of earth. So that got rid of the idea of a village, the idea of the palace, the idea of an assembly of monks, and even the idea of the wilderness surrounding them. So now what happens? What's the next step? Further, Ananda, the monk, not attending to the perception of wilderness, not attending to the perception of earth, attends to the singleness based on the perception of the dimension of the infinity of space. His mind takes pleasure, finds satisfaction, settles and indulges in its perception of the dimension of the infinity of space. So what does this mean? Huh? See, you have to think about these things. The Buddha is not going to give you your realizations and insights on a silver platter. You have to do some work. You have to analyze it. You have to cross-question it. Uh, we quoted that sutta before, that the monks who are intelligent cross-question the sutras. They discuss among themselves. This is why I'm trying to get you all to make intelligent comments and cross-question the idea in the suttas. Don't be lazy. Look up the terms. Try to figure out what it means. So what does this mean? So far, he's abstracted all of the earthy elements into one perception, one singularity, earth. And now he's not putting any attention on that. Instead, he's seeing the singularity of space. Now remember what I told you about the Vedic approach being positivist and the Buddhist approach being negative logic. Well, here's a perfect example. If you take any object, let's take, oh, here's a good one, this bowl. Here's a nice little bowl, huh? And you say, well, where is the space around this bowl? Well, there's space around it, huh? and there's also space inside it. So what's the difference between the space around the bowl and the space inside the bowl? Nothing. You cannot tell the difference. If you were to take a, a pinch of space from outside and a pinch from inside, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. They're exactly the same. But if you put together both the space around the bowl and the space in the bowl, 
they make the exact opposite of the shape of the bowl. Isn't it? The exact complement. Whatever space an object takes up, the space around it forms the exact opposite. In other words, it's the negation of the solidity of the object. Think about that for a second. So if you're in the wilderness and you see, oh, there's no people, there's no village, there's so many things that are absent, the only thing here is earth. And then you take that view and reverse it, negativize it like this. See, all the information is still there, but it's just been flipped to the obverse, the converse, the reverse. <laughs> Plus becomes minus, minus becomes plus. Now I'll go back because I know that's uncomfortable to look at. <laughs> so if you take any object, huh? here's a bottle. We take the space around the bottle and simply flip it. And now what do we have? We have a vision of space, which surrounds the form, the shape of the bottle. It's a simple concept, but it's very profound. Why? It enables us to visualize space as the converse of form. And in the Diamond Sutra, it says form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. What does that mean? <laughs> it means that form is just the reverse of emptiness. Emptiness is just the reverse of form. So you see how easy it is to visualize space, which is a kind of emptiness. All you have to do is flip one bit. <laughs> Positive space or positive form is surrounded by negative space. Negative space is the opposite of positive form. So here is where we, uh, our takeoff roll reaches, <laughs> reaches the rotate stage and we pull up and we're off the ground. How is that? We have switched from positive logic to negative logic. And negative logic is required to realize emptiness. Because emptiness is a negation. A negation of what? A negation of form. A negation of being, existence, being and becoming. So in this way, we switch from the positivist view to the view of negative logic, apophysis, negative theology. Huh? Remember we put up the definition the other day? Apophatic refers to apophysis. Apophysis means negative theology. Negative theology means saying what God or the absolute is not. So what it's not is it's not being. It's not becoming, it's not even space. <laughs> space is only part way there, but it's an important step. In, well, I'll read the rest of this section first. He discerns that whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of wilderness are not present. Whatever disturbances that would exist based on the perception of earth are not present. There is only this modicum of disturbance, the singleness based on the perception of the dimension of the infinity of space. He discerns that 
This mode of perception is empty of the perception of wilderness. This mode of perception is empty of the perception of earth. There is only this non-emptiness, the singleness based on the perception of the dimension of the infinity of space. Thus, he regards it as empty of whatever is not there. Whatever remains, he discerns as present. There is this. And so this, his entry into emptiness, accords with actuality, is undistorted in meaning, and pure. So you see, Buddha is giving us the entry into emptiness. Buddha is giving us a way to convert our thinking from positivist to negative. You see, to understand the Buddha's thinking, you have to realize that any attempt to define the absolute in positive terms is going to lead to failure. Even the idea of space, an infinity of space, has the problem that space means dimension. Dimension means measurement, distance. That means there can be a here and a there and an in-between. That means there can be motion. That means there can be time. That means there can be change, a change in location, a change in acceleration, a change in mass, a change in time, past and future. And that brings in all the stuff <laughs> of being and becoming, the whole Paticca Samuppada. Because Paticca Samuppada is powered by the vortex between what? Sankara, consciousness, name and form. So it's still not completely pure. It's still not complete emptiness, even space is not complete emptiness. But space has one wonderful advantage. If the space is truly infinite, if it's really unlimited, the whole creation can get lost in it without a trace. <laughs> Off in some obscure corner, of infinite space. You see, this creation, this manifestation, this beingness, this universe is not really such a big deal. Infinite space is a much, much bigger deal. Even though infinite space is not completely pure, it still has the possibility of manifesting phenomena because it's the infrastructure, it's the cosmos, hmm? the physics required for being and becoming, the space-time continuum, the background, the context required for being and becoming, which is suffering, which is repeated birth and death, Huh? Let's not forget, which is ignorance and desire. So it's the background, it's the context for samsara, for suffering. But still, we have, we have taken a big step here. We've gone from the positivist view to the negativist view. And we've created a big enough background, a big enough space that the whole creation can get lost in it. And we're left with simply 
infinite space. Om Tat Sat. Buddha Saranai. <laughs>